But look at verse number 8 there, Jeremiah 21, verse number 8. It says, And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life. The title for the sermon this evening is The Way of Life. Okay, so what we're going to see when we get to verse number 8 is that God is offering them the way of life or the way of death. Okay? God is presenting an option. God is giving the people, what do you want? Do you want to live or do you want to die? And you know what? This is, this is something that we're all confronted with in our lives. We're all confronted with this question and we're going to be looking at what kind of truths that we, uh, that, uh, we can get out of this. Um, if you're paying attention there in this chapter... It's not a very good chapter for the Jews. Not a very good chapter at all. Let's pick it up there in verse number 1. It says, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, when King Zedekiah sent unto him Pesha the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah the son of Maasiah, the priest, saying... Now, you may think that this pasture that is coming to Jeremiah, that King Zedekiah is sending, you may think it's the same pasture from the previous chapter. You may remember that there was a pasture that smote Jeremiah on his face, you know, and put him into stocks and made him a public uh, reproach. It's not the same guy. You know, I remember I used to read this as a kid and I thought, oh man, you know, finally this guy, you know, it's the same, I thought it was the same guy. <laughs> you know, until you pay attention and you can see that this pasture, it says here, his pasture the son of Melchiah, and if you just go in the previous chapter, Jeremiah chapter uh, 20, verse number 1, it says, Now Pasha, the son of Emer, the priest. So you can see that the fathers are different. So it's a different Pasha that's coming to Jeremiah. But just very quickly, you may recall that Jeremiah 20 ended in a very dark place for Jeremiah. He was very distraught. He was very heartbroken. You know, he, he wished that he was never born. You may remember that, okay? And what I like about Jeremiah 21 is now, it, it, you know, he got to this place of, of sadness and, and uh, just cast down. But now the king of, of Judah is sending his people to go and ask Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what is the Lord saying? I mean, all this time, right? Uh, from Jeremiah chapter 1 to Jeremiah chapter 20, they're ignoring Jeremiah. They're mocking Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you're crazy. You're insane. You're an idiot. You're not preaching God's word the way you ought to. But we come to Jeremiah 21, and now the king wants to know, what's, go to Jeremiah, ask him what's going on. What, what, is the Lord, what does the Lord have to say? And so, you know, never give up. You know, as, as people that stand on the word of God, never give up on the word of God. You know, if you're a preacher, never give up preaching God's word, even though you may face some difficulties. You know, there will come times when your own enemies will turn around and say, I need to hear what you have to say. I, I realize that you are a true man of God. I realize you are a preacher that's preaching the truth. I need to start paying attention instead of mocking what you have to say. Th those situations will turn around on you. You know, I've had situations where, you know, it's no secret that as a church we believe in a post-tribulation, pre raph rapture. And I had people mock me. I had people laugh at me. I had people, you know, think that I'm insane for believing such things. Many of those same people now believe in a post-trip pre raph rapture. Okay. Many of those people realize, oh man, what was being said by, by Kevin at that time was true. They've gone back, they look at God's word and say, well, this lines up with what God was saying. And so you're going you're to see situations like this. It's a great thing when those that laugh at you actually now you know, change. They realize, man, you are speaking God's truth and I need to hear what you have to say. Verse number two. Inquire, I pray thee, of the Lord for us. They go to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, tell us, what does God have to say? For Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, maketh war against us. If so be that the Lord will deal with us accordingly with all his wondrous works, that he may go up from us. So you can see here that king Nebuchadrezzar has already started his war against Judah. He's already started the war, okay? And I'm going to give you a bit of a historical context here. So we know it's King Zedekiah. Okay, we know King Zedekiah knows that Jeremiah is a true prophet of God, right? So let's learn who King uh, Zedekiah is. Keep your finger there and go to 2 Kings for me. Go to uh, 2 Kings 24, 2 Kings 24, because I want to show you that God's judgment has already started to fall. It's already fallen, okay? And this is why now they realize what, what Jeremiah was saying is true. You know, all the other prophets of the land were saying, no, it's going to be just fine. We're going to be at peace. It's all good. God's not going to judge us. And now you see the Babylonians are coming. They, they are making war. They are causing havoc for the people of Judah. You're turning to 2 Kings 24. Look at verse number 1. 2 Kings 24, 
verse number one, it says, In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. So you can see here that King Jehoiakim is the one that's ruling, not Zedekiah yet. Uh, Jehoiakim is ruling in Judah during this time. And you can see the king of Babylon has already come. Okay? And now this king, King Jehoiakim, is servant to King Nebuchadnezzar for three years. Okay? So King Nebuchadnezzar is slowly grabbing power from Judah. This was a long, drawn process. This wasn't some you know, six-month war or something like this. You know, he came, he showed power, he tried to take over uh, you know, uh, Judah, but he left the king there. You know, if you as a king will serve me, fine, you can continue serving me, but you're under my authority is what's happening, right? Judah's already under the authority of the Babylonians here, okay? But you can see here, three years later, the king, uh, jo uh, sorry, yeah, Jehoiakim rebels. He goes, enough, I'm, I'm sick of, I'm tired of having this power over me. I'm sick and tired of this foreign power. You know, he shouldn't be in place. I'm the king of, of, of Judah. And so he rebels. Well, you know, you may think that's a good thing to do, right? I mean, because King Nebuchadnezzar, is a, he's a wicked king. Babylon is a wicked empire. It's a wicked power. It may seem like, it might, might seem logical. Let's rebel and fight against them. But what happens in verse number two? It says, And the Lord sent against him, that's against King Jehoiakim, bands of the Chaldees, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and bands of the children of Ammon. Listen, none of these nations, none of these people are good people. Okay? and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which is spake by his servants, the prophets. Of course, Jeremiah being one of those prophets. That's telling them, right? So you can see here that Babylon is truly an empire. It's truly a world power that it has the Chaldeans, the Syrians, the Moabites, the children of Ammon, all under their authority, right? And they've got their own armies, and you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is using these armies to go up against Judah because they rebelled against him. But notice, verse number two, and the Lord sent against him. The Lord is allowing this to happen. The Lord is giving Nebuchadnezzar the power to be a hostile, you know, to, to uh, bring forth this hostile takeover. It's part of God's judgment. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I want to show you there that this truly is a, a world power. You have multiple nations, right, Un <clears throat> under the authority of one man. And, you know, when we look at Australia today, when we look at the world today, we look at the situation we're in. You know, I'm kind of sick and tired of talking about it, but, you know, it's, <laughs> I keep saying this, but I've got to bring it up, right, with COVID and all this. And you notice that every nation, just about every nation, you know, is in compliance with what to do. Like, as soon as this, this uh, disease or this virus, whatever you want to call it, right, uh, has come into play, Basically, you know, the nation of Australia, the United States, many, a lot of European nations, they've all done the same thing. The restrictions, the lockdowns, the masks, now all of these nations are trying to roll out uh, the vaccines. Why is it that every nation just seems to be doing the same thing? I mean, if, if, if every nation was truly sovereign, don't you think different nations would come up with different ideas of how to handle this? Why is it that everybody's doing the same thing? Because there's... Because it's, it's, it's an empire, okay? It, it's not as obvious as a Babylonian empire, but as a hidden empire, there are powers that are dictating to, you know, uh, our politicians, to those that are in, in power over nations with how to deal with this current situation. Yeah. You know, the entire world is doing the same thing. But, you know, there are some rare countries that are doing kind of different things, right? You, I don't know if you've heard of Sweden. Sweden have basically said, you know what, we're not going to have any restrictions. We're going to allow COVID-19 to just run rampant in our nation. And sure, there was, a, there was a surge. But now they're saying, I think toward the end of last year, they're saying that the people have a, herd, a natural herd immunity against COVID. Because they just allowed it to go through the nation. And just allowed people to fight it. You know, just, just the God-given immune system that we have to allow that to fight. Yes, they lost people. that They lost lives. But hey, that's one nation that did things a little differently. Uh, another nation that uh, is doing things a little bit differently, but not so much. Uh, but one, one pe person that I see rebelling is the uh, Brazilian pr uh, president. I don't know if you've, you've paid attention to the Brazilian president, okay? I even though apparently there's many people in his nation that are losing their lives over this, but he's saying, like, he's, he's really contrary uh, to, to what's going on. Like, he speaks out against uh, all these restrictions and things like that. I don't know how long he's going to stay in power. You know, people that rebel, like, like King um, uh, Je uh, Jehoiakim here, 
they don't rebel for very long when you've got this power over the nations. All right. And so, you know, again, when we go for Jeremiah, you know, I believe the Lord's put this in my heart because there are a lot of similarities. There's a lot of similarities in the world that we live in right now. Okay. Now, as I said, there's a united front, you know, to bring in these strict measures. And we see this united front from people that are natural enemies, the Syrians, Moabites, Chaldees, Ammon. They're all going against uh, Judah and against King Jehoiakim because they've rebelled in this situation. Now, let's jump down to verse number six. Let's see what happens to Jehoiakim. Verse number six, it says, So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers. So that means he died. <laughs> okay? This guy tries to rebel, he dies. He, he, couldn't, he, was, he wasn't a match to King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? And then it says, And Jehoiachin, or Hen I should, sorry, and Jehoiakin, uh, his son, reigned in his stead. So now his son becomes the king, right? Now, drop down to verse number 11. It says, And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And he carried away... Oh, sorry, drop down to verse number 15 now. So you can see that King Nebuchadnezzar once again goes up against the city because the son doesn't obey what King Nebuchadnezzar wants. Okay, you can look at this in your own time. And then look at verse number 15. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land... Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. And the king of Babylon made... Now look at... Oh, actually, let, before I read verse number 17, so I want you to notice that this time, King Jeho Jehoiah Kim, Kin, okay, he did not lose his life, but, you know, he was taken into captivity, and not just himself, but his family, you know, those that are in, in authority within his kingdom, those mighty men that were powerful warriors, they were all taken into captivity by uh, the Babylonian king. And again, you might say, well, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's good to rise up against this power, but you notice they're losing. No matter what king it is, they're losing this battle, okay? And so King Nebuchadnezzar does something slightly different now. If you look at verse number 17... So instead of allowing Judah to choose their own king, he steps in now, verse number 17, and the king of Babylon made Mataniah, now notice that name, Mataniah, his father's brother, that's the father's brother, so that's Jehoiakim's brother, okay, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. So when we see Jeremiah and Zedekiah sending his servants to speak to Jeremiah, his real name is Mataniah. Okay, and the reason he's in power is because the king of Babylon put him in power. Okay, this wasn't a natural succession of the family. You know, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar felt, well, maybe this Mataniah is, is going to obey me. Maybe he's going to, uh, you know, allow me to just have power over this land. And so, and he not, not just puts him into power, but he changes his name to Zedekiah. All right, so basically showing that he owns him. You know, I, I'm in charge. I can call you what I want. You're called Zedekiah. Okay, and so this is his name going forward, you know, King Zedekiah. And so that's what leads us to uh, Jeremiah chapter 21. Hope that kind of makes sense. Gives you a bit of a historical context, okay? So you can definitely see Nebuchadnezzar, the armies of Babylon, they're already there in the land. They're, they're already there causing havoc, okay? And uh, the reason I want to bring this up, brethren, is because, you know, in, in light of our current days, you need to be careful of what battles you fight. You have to be careful what battles you fight. You know, some battles seem very righteous to fight, but they may not be the Lord's battles. You know, this situation, COVID-19, whatever you think about it, brethren, you know, I've had time to think about this and meditate on this. You know, my personal opinion, you know, and you can disagree with me, but my personal opinion is we are seeing the judgment of God on the world. Okay, we are seeing the judgment of God. Now, is, 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 when we look at uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the king of, and Babylon, is that, is that a godly kingdom? Is that a godly empire? Uh, they're wicked, all right? And, and they're, they're oppressing the Jews. They're oppressing the people, right? And, and, and they're, they're putting their plans in charge. And, you know, what, what I see is an oppression of the people in this world. You know, what I see is a judgment of God. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, we have to consider, we have to be very wise about the decisions we fight. Because we may fight against this judgment, if it's a judgment of God, you may lose your life, like King Jehoiakim, okay? Or you may choose, like the next king, to fight, and then you have your family taken into captivity. You know, they're, they're in a worse place 
uh, fighting against his power than just, you know, accepting the reality of the situation, right? And now you have King Zedekiah, you know, and he's going to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you know, what is God saying about this situation? You know, is God going to deliver us? So we need to be careful what kind of, you know, what battles we fight in this current world. We're living in a, in a real scenario that demands a lot of questions, you know, demands a lot of answers. You know, we have different opinions with how to manage things. And you've got to consider, what do I have to risk? Could I risk my life? Could I risk my family? Are you willing to risk that? You know, uh, when I talk to, like, the young single men, generally speaking, I'm not having a go at you if that's you, right? But it's like, you know what, I'm going to fight to the day I die. You know, they can take my life and I'm just going to fight it all. Oh, I mean, that's, that's great. You speak about that because you don't have much to lose. But then when you talk about to a family man, a man who's got a wife and kids, and they know that, hey, my family can be taken into captivity if I'm not careful. You know, they've got something greater to, to risk. You talk to a church pastor, myself. Not only do I have a family, but I've got a church here in Sydney and church up there in, in uh, New Life Baptist Church. So there are families that uh, obviously love the church, are part of the church, and, and sometimes they look at me for leadership. And, and so, of course, the decisions I make will have a greater risk. You know, the, the more you have under you, the greater the risk is to, in your decisions, in your opinions of how you fight. So you need a lot of wisdom. You, you need a lot of wisdom. You know, I, I wish, that, uh, you know, there was just this Jeremiah, right? <laughs> He's like, hey, Jeremiah, tell us what to do, right? Now, look, here's what we have, though. We have the Word of God. You know, it, it's the Word of God that would come upon Jeremiah and he would preach some, such things. We also have the Word of God. And so when we decide to fight, we need to look at what does the Word of God have to say? Is this a fight worth fighting? Is this a battle worth fighting? Is this a battle God wants us to fight? Or is it not? Is it the judgment of God, potentially? And, you know, a natural reaction is, but they're ungodly, they're, they're wicked, you know? These people that are trying to bring in the vaccinations and, and, and they're trying to put on, uh, you know, force the masks and, and all these things. Surely these people are wicked. Surely they're worth fighting. But if it's the judgment of God, you're going to lose. Like, you have to consider these things. You have to weigh these things up. You know, do we have the word of God to fight these things or do we not? And I, I'm not telling you that I have the answer to everything. Obviously, I did not think when we started 2019, that we're going to end up in this situation. I did not think that in 2020 I was going to be down here in Sydney, right? Everything's different. Everything's changed. Everything's changed. And for the Jews, everything changed. You've got the Babylonians there, breathing down their necks, putting their own people in power, okay? And Zedekiah is caught between these, you know, a rock and a hard place. He, he wants to know what Jeremiah has to say, but at the same time, he's got King Nebuchadnezzar on his back. And he's already seen what King Nebuchadnezzar has done to the past two kings. So he's trying to be careful. What do we do? Back to Jeremiah 21, verse number 3. And look, I'm not here trying to give you every answer here. I just want you to think about the situation. Think about what we read here. Think about 2020 and 2021, how we are in this current situation. And, you know, pray for wisdom. You know, for, for fathers, pray for wisdom. You know, you're leading your families. You know, pray for your pastor. You know, I'm leading two churches. I need the wisdom of God. I need the word of God to make the best decisions. Uh, yeah, you know, the right decisions. Even though it may seem like sometimes, hey, this is something we don't fight. You know, and, and if you see that from me, you need to understand, you know, it's not that uh, it's, it's a fear thing or it's a, it's a given up thing. You know, the title for the sermon uh, this evening was The Way of Life. You know, I want to choose the way of life. Okay, we'll soon see how this plays out in this chapter. Look at verse number three. Then said Jeremiah unto them, Thus shall ye say to Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands. Hold on, that's not what we want, Jeremiah. We want God to turn the weapons of war in the hands of the Babylonians. God is saying, you know what? You think you're going to fight with your, these weapons? I'm going to take these weapons away from you. You're not going to be able to fight with these weapons. Okay? Verse number, uh, continue, verse number four, it says, Wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls, and I will assemble them into the midst of this city. God is saying, you know what? You think I'm going to fight for you? No. I'm going to help the Babylonians. I'm going to assemble the armies of the Babylonians, and they're going to come into the midst of your city. You know, it's been okay. They've been breathing down your necks. Okay, but now I'm going to allow them to come in the midst of your city. I'm going to, I'm going to send them exactly where you don't want them. 
You know, King Zedekiah is hoping, right? What did he say in verse number two? Uh, it says, uh, if so be that the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works. You know, King Zedekiah is hoping, hey, J Jeremiah, ask God, will he do a miracle? Is he going to save us from King, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians? We want to see the wondrous works of God. And God says, yeah, I'm going to show you my wondrous works. I'm going to fight against you. I'm sending the Babylonians. You know, th th these, are, these are hard chapters, you know, to, to sort of think about and apply. You know, they, these are challenging things. God will turn their weapons against them. Verse number five. This, these are the words of God. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever seen like war films, maybe, you know, some of those uh, old war films where you have soldiers with uh, swords and spears. And quite often you'll have like a, a troop of soldiers and before they go to, to war, they get pumped up. Maybe they bang some drums or something, right? Getting them pumped up for the fight. And then when they charge, it's like, ah! And they go charging, right? They go yelling, you know, showing their anger, showing their wrath, you know? And, you, you know, the thing about that is the pe person that's running at you, screaming and yelling, may not even be the most powerful warrior. But just the anger and the wrath that they're showing can cause the enemy to, you know, re maybe retreat, be worried, you know, lose confidence. You know, and that's, that's the point of showing the anger and the, and the wrath. And God's saying, look, I'm going to come in the same way. I'm going to come yelling and screaming, showing you my wrath, showing me, you my, my fury. And so this is what we have to be aware that, you know, God can fight even his own people. It's, it's hard, you know, it's hard to understand sometimes, you know. But we live in a wicked world. We live in a wicked nation. You know, um, I, I'm kind of, in a way, you know, I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing our, 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 our nation, our world, just, just, I don't know, it's just going to the toilet. It's, it's just every, every day just seems like something new, right? Mr. Potato Head, do you guys know about that toy? My kids don't have Mr. Potato Head, but now they wanted to remove the Mr., you know, because, you know, they, they, don't want, they don't want to offend the LGBT QI, whatever. And you, you can get a family Mr. Potato Head where normally you get Mr. Potato Head, Mrs. Potato Head and a child. Well, now there's enough things to make it into two men if you want or two women and a child if you want. So they want to they wanna promote, you know, this, this un, these ungodly families. They're not even families. They're these ungodly unions to our children. Yeah. And that's the least of it. Just recently you've had Dr. Seuss books being cancelled in the U.S., because they're too racist, uh, uh, several books being too... It, it's, I don't know what is going on, right? What is going on? You know, uh, on Facebook, I, I was on Facebook today, and uh, it's on the New South Wales government website. They've coloured all these uh, streets in, in the rainbow colours. Yeah. And, and not, not the rainbow colours of the Lord, but in the homosexual rainbow colours, yeah. right? And I, and I just replied with, with just uh, an emoji. You know what an emoji is? Just a little face that's just thrown up. Like, bleh, bleh, right? I don't, bleh. And I've had some people support me, right? Just respond back, and, but a lot of them are mocking. Like, they, they, they've gone to my profile, they've seen me with my, well, my photo had 10 kids, not 11 yet, right? And they're mocking our family, they're mocking how many kids we have. You know, I mean, the world has gone upside down. I mean, what, what is supposed to be a normal family? A husband that loves his wife, who's got a bunch of kids, that is considered unusual and evil right now, yeah. you know? I mean, the world is going crazy. Yeah. But you know, part of, part of me is frustrated, yes, but another part of me is kind of like, this is actually helping me. Because any attachments that I have to this world, it's slowly just coming off. It's almost like, I just, almost like you know what? Let the world go to the toilet then. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where, where sometimes you're kind of like, no, no, I want to stop it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm still going to preach to God. I'm just going to do what God wants me to do, right? I'm going to fight the battles that God wants me to fight. You know, just being married. Just having kids is a battle now. That's the fight. That's the fight right now. <laughs> just, just living a natural, normal life, just coming to church is the battle. I mean, just doing normal things that were normal five years ago has become the battle. But th these are battles that I know God wants us to fight. Yep. It's just, it's deciding what are the battles to fight and what are the battles not to fight. And we have to be think, thinking about these things. You know, and I, don't, I, I realize that we're not always going to see eye to eye, and that's fine. You know, but I just pray that God gives us the wisdom to make the right decisions, to fight the right battles. Understand this world is, this is why I, I truly believe it is the judgment of God. I mean, how bad does this world have to get before God judges this world? 
I, I think we're there. I mean, uh, again, we go for Jeremiah. How many times does it look like Australia? If God was willing to judge the j- nation of Judah there, then surely he's judging our nation today. That's my opinion. Okay, um, I, I realize I can't, the Bible doesn't say here, thus saith the Lord, God is judging Australia. Okay, I'm giving you my opinion based on what we see here in the, in, in the scriptures. Okay, you need to form your opinions as well. What verse am I up to, brethren? Sorry, got a bit off target there. Verse number six. And I will smite the inhabitants of the city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. (laughs) I don't know. I I saw that. I said, COVID-19. And and again, you know, people have different opinions. You know, is it legit? Is it all a hoax? Is it just a flu? Is is it just a, you know, redesigned flu virus? That was something like that, right? That's more contagious. This is why I've never had an opinion on the virus itself. You know, you ask me, what do you think about it? I don't care. I, I, I actually believe I'm going to go to my grave never knowing the truth of this. But there's a lot of things that I realize I'm just not going to know. Because, yes, you can get data, okay? Yes, there's, there's information out there. And, uh, you know, people base their opinions on the information. But many times that information or that data itself is corrupt. I mean, just recently, uh, there's this, uh, I forget his name, but there's a, there's a mayor in, in New York. Does anyone know his name? He's been in the news lately. Anyway, last year he was being praised by the media that, that he, that he uh, you know, uh, put restrictions in place in New York. And, he, you know, New York is a very dense population, so a lot of people died of the virus. And, you know, apparently by his actions, by his quick actions, by his restrictions, you know, he, um, he stopped, you know, who knows how many people that were supposed to die. And, and he was being praised as a hero. Well, it was found out just recently, just in the last few months or last few weeks, that he's been doctoring the stats. That he's actually been doing, he's been, he's been put, uh, sending people that were contagious with the virus to places like nursing homes where there are older people and there's been deaths that, that happened that weren't being recorded. He was doing all, he was, he was fudging the numbers. He was fudging the stats, okay? And now there are calls for this guy, I think it's Como, Como, something like that, uh, to step down and to resign from his position. Hey, he was, being a, he was a hero last year. I think they gave him one of these, like, like one of those Hollywood awards. Like, like an Emmy or something. What, what an Emmy or what's the other one? They, Grammy. The Grammys? I don't know. He gave, they gave him one of these awards like Hollywood. You know, such a hero. Now they're saying, sack this guy because he doctored the... I, look, you know, the reason I know that a lot of these stats are, are just corrupt and messed up is because, you know, I, I worked in, in the business world. And, you know, it, when, when you're in business and you're in sales and, you know, you, you present how well your department's doing and how well the sales are going, how well customer feedback is and how well customer return is, and you're, you're trying to feed this information to people that are interested, you can take the same data that may show you to be a very bad performer and the way you present it can cause you to look like you're doing so well. <laughs> you know, it, it, it all, it's all in the hands of the person that's presenting the information. Okay, and this is why I just I just realized. Look, I'm just I'm not going to know, and I don't care. You know, I'm I'm not going to know. And and you know, when it came to King Zedekiah, he did not know. You know, th- this judgment that was coming by the Babylonians is it from God or is it not from God? Do we fight? Is God going to fight for us? And the answer was no. God's going to fight against you, right? And, and there are some times that there are these situations that you know you don't really know necessarily. You know, and I'm not going to get caught up on that. But you just have to deal with the reality of the situation you find yourself in. You know, that, that we have a power, a very wicked, you know, a very hidden power, a very hidden empire breathing down the necks of the world, you know, the, the citizens of the world. And that's just the reality that we're in, and, and this is something we have to, to deal with, you have to face. You know, King Zedekiah had to face the reality that the Babylonians are on his back. Okay? Now, um, verse number seven. It says, and afterwards, uh, saith the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants, and the people, and such are as left in the city from the pestilence, from the sword, and from the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those that seek their life. And he shall smite them with the edge of the sword, he shall not spare them, neither have pity, nor have mercy." So God is saying, look, if you happen to escape the pestilence, if you happen to live through the sword, if you happen to live through the famine, well, then you're going to be taken into captivity and then you're going to die there. Okay? So there's no positive outcome here. This is the reality of the situation. Now, how are they going to deal with it? 
Okay? Now, obviously, not all died that went into captivity because there had to be generations that lived through that would eventually return during that 70-year captivity back to Judah. But look at verse number 8. It says, And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. You have those options. Which one do you want? Do you want life or death? Okay. Now, before we keep reading, before we go into the context of this chapter, you know, God is basically giving people a decision to make. Do you want life? Do you want death? Can you please uh, keep your finger there and go to Romans chapter 6 for me. Romans chapter 6. And these are obviously very common passages. If you're a soul winner, you know this passage very well. And if you're in church today, I trust that you have made the decision of the way of life. Okay? Because we want to draw some spiritual lessons here, right? There is an option. In Romans 6.23, the Bible reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if we want to take this just as a spiritual lesson for salvation, God offers us life or death. Okay? God does not force you to choose life. Calvinism is a false do doctrine where they teach basically God forces you. You know, it's, it's just, you know, God draws you. It's too hard to resist and you're, you're just, you're going to be regenerated and then you're going to believe the gospel somehow. Okay? No, that's, that, no, God's giving you an option. Do you want life or do you want death? When we knock on someone's door and go soul winning, do you want life or do you want death? If they choose death, what, they choose death, we move on. Okay, hopefully we've planted some seeds. Hopefully they choose life eventually. They still have time to choose the life, okay? But that's ultimately what we're doing when we go, don't we? Do you want life or do you want death? It's up to you. We're not going to force you. It's up, it's up to you. It's your choice, okay? Now go to Romans 8, 6, please. Romans 8, 6. And I, I did preach on this just recently when I went through the fruits of the Spirit on the topic of peace. But now that we are saved, now that we have chosen eternal life and not eternal death, we still have choices in our Christian life to make, Okay? In Romans 8, 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So you see, even as a Christian, you have a choice. Do I, you know, my mind, do I put it on spiritual matters? You know, do I allow myself to have a spiritual mind, thinking about eternal matters, thinking about eternal rewards in heaven, my home in heaven, or do I think about this carnal earth that, that's here in this place? Which one am I going to be focused on? You know, which battles am I going to fight? The spiritual ones or the carnal ones? You know, the Bible's telling us here that carnally minded is death. I want to choose life. This is why it's so important that we are, are mindful about the decisions we make. The, the battles that we fight. Are they ones to life or are they ones to death? Okay? We have to make decisions even in our Christian walk. You know, life or death. Now, of course, that's not salvation. But that's just... You know, how well, I guess, you enjoy this life that God has given you. You can destroy your life. You know, a saved person can just be carnally minded for the rest of his life, destroy his life with sin, maybe end his life early, potentially, just destroy his life. He's still going to heaven, okay? But he didn't do much for the Lord in his lifetime, okay? So we have these decisions. God is asking us, do you want the carnal mind? Do you want the spiritual mind? Do you want life or do you want death? And so, you know, life should always be chosen over death. You know, I've already preached about abortion as we've been going through Jeremiah. You know, that's why I'm pro-life. Pro-life. Choose life, not death. Every time a woman goes into those abortion clinics, they're choosing death. Okay, it's, it's killing their babies and potentially even damaging their womb from having children in the future. Okay, I've already preached about abortion, but I wanted to look at euthanasia. Do you guys know what euthanasia is? I think maybe the kids don't know. But basically, this is assisted suicide. Assisted suicide. So you know people take their own lives. They kill themselves for whatever reason. Okay? But, you know, it, it's been pushed hard, especially in Australia, to legalise euthanasia. Legalise assisted suicide, or what I would call legal murder. Okay? Allowing people to, to die, to choose death. Now, I was surprised by, by this just the short research that I did. But you know, there's only one state at the moment that has legalized euthanasia, assisted suicide. Does anyone want to guess what that state is? In Australia, in Australia. Victoria, bingo. Guess where COVID-19 has hit the hardest? Now, when was it made, when, when did COVID-19 hit our shores? 
Yeah, probably early 2020, right? Started to hit our shores. Well, you know, euthanasia was made legal in Victoria in June 2019. June 2019. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that's why they got hit the hardest with COVID. I'm just throwing you, I'm just asking the question. All right. I mean, kind of, it just makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. And now, uh, also, Western Australia is looking to make it legal uh, at the mid of this year as well. Okay, mid-2021, Western Australia is looking at making euthanasia legal. Watch Western Australia. <laughs> Watch Western Australia. All right. So I'm just throwing that out there, okay? Our Australian states are starting to choose death. They've already chosen death with abortion. Now they want to increase the death. They want more death. So God's sending them death. If that's what you want, okay, you get to choose death or you get to choose life, okay? And don't forget, I know we're believers. I know we're contrary to these things, but we still live in this nation, okay? So when God's judgment falls on a nation, it still affects the people of God. Remember that, okay? It still affected God's people, okay? Those that were saved. You know, we have the great story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. These are great men of God that went into captivity into Babylon. They were affected by the judgment of God. Okay, they lost their homes. They lost their families. You know, so, you know, don't think that, you know, we just escape God's judgment. No, you know, yes, God's going to deal with us as his children, you know, but we're still going to feel the effects, you know, if God is judging this nation. And I, I truly believe we are feeling these effects. Now, back to the context. When we saw, when, when God is offering that nation, choose the way of life or choose the way of death. Verse number nine. It says, He that abideth in this city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Now, let's stop there. So what is death? If they try to hide, if they try to escape the judgment, God is saying, look, you're going to die. You're going to die. Okay? You try to abide in the city. The city was obviously the, the main fortress uh, for Judah, the safest place. If you try to hide there, you try to avoid the sword, the famine, pestilence, you, you're going to, oh, sorry, you are going to die by those measures, right? Then it says this, but he that goeth out, so you, you, you leave the protections of the city and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you, you surrender. This is unpopular, okay? He shall live and his life shall be unto him for a prey. So when the offer was made, choose life or death, what was the way of life in the context of this chapter? The context was go and surrender. It's God's judgment. It's the reality. You're not going to fight it. You're not going to win. You try to fight it, you're going to lose your life. Okay? So, you know, be patient with decisions that we have in 2021. You know, it's, it's not a coincidence that the Lord's put Jeremiah, 50, you know, Jeremiah on my heart to preach because there are way, just way too many similarities. Way too much. Okay? Be, be careful. You know, when, when you're angered, and I get angry and you're frustrated. I get frustrated. You know, when you're upset and you realize the new normal's around the corner or we're in the new normal or whatever. Well, this was a new normal for Judah. This is the way it was going to be. <laughs> right? And the best thing to do is, well, just accept this is the way it's going to be. It's God's judgment. Now, in the new normal, work out how it is that you're going to be able to serve the Lord at your fullest. You know, I want us to, to, to turn out like a Daniel, like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's what I want us to be. You know, when, when a new normal hits, when, when, when we see a, a power take over, you know, the freedoms and the liberties that we have as a nation. If you want to fight, you can fight. I'll be praying for you. You know, I hope you succeed. <laughs> I hope you find the Babylonian king and stab him and they run away. It's about, you know, the likelihood of that happening is very, very small. But there's one that fights for us, and that's the Lord God. Amen. Okay? The Lord God might be fighting against Australia. He might be fighting against the world's systems. You know? um, and he's using wicked people. You know? God was using wicked Babylon. Okay? And uh, I, actually, we will look at this soon. We'll look at that soon. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. I'm skipping ahead. Verse number 10. It says, For I have set my face against this city for evil and not for good, saith the Lord. So if God is judging Australia, why is it? Because he has set his face against this nation or this city for evil, not for good, saith the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. 
It shall be given. It's going to happen. You can't stop it. Okay? Now, again, don't misunderstand. Babylon is a wicked empire. It's a wicked empire. They are a wicked people. Okay? And this is where the, the battle lines are, become a little bl bit blurry. Because we know, we know the world system, the authorities, we know how wicked they are. We know that they, 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 they want to stop people producing. They're not happy that I have 11 kids, I'll tell you that. Okay? <laughs> they don't want people to reproduce. They certainly do not want Christians to reproduce. Yeah. They're fine with the Muslims reproducing, but certainly not the Christians. All right? There's a, there's a wicked nation there. And, and, and so it, it may seem right to fight. And you've you got to figure out when, when it is to fight and when it is not. It's just, you know, pray about it. Think about it. Okay? Let's talk about it, you know, and understand that people have different opinions, okay? We all have some different, a different measure of risk to take, okay, when it comes to God's judgment. But if you can please keep your finger there and go to Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. <coughs> because like you... I want the powers of this world to be destroyed, okay? I think we all want that, right? We want our liberties and our peace. We want that. I, I really want that, okay? So that, to, this is why I want to read Jeremiah chapter 50 to you. Look at verse number 17, just so you don't lose focus of the big picture here. It says here, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria had devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, have broken his bones. So you can see that God is using these two nations, Assyria and, and Babylon, to judge the nation of Judah and Israel. Okay, The northern kingdom by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom by the Babylonians. Verse number 18. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. The reason I want to read that to you, brethren, is because if you choose life, and you realize by choosing life, you're going to have to give up some of your liberties. Okay, and that's hard to swallow. Well, I'll, the reason I want to read that to you, brethren, is this, because God's judgment will come on all. God's judgment will come on all. Okay, even the same wicked powers that God may allow you know, to enter into and control our world and control our society, those same wicked powers, if God is allowing that to be His judgment, will also be judged at the hands of God. And this is where the true peace comes. Whether some old normal, some new normal, this is a new normal for Judah. When you can just rest on the thought that God will judge. God will judge me as His, as his child, as a Christian. God is judging our nation. Because it's a wicked one, and God is judging this world, and then God will judge the same people that He's using to bring forth judgment on those that He's judging. Okay? God's in control, is what I'm trying to say. God is on His throne, He's in control. He knows what's going on. He knows. Okay? If this leads us to a one world government, if this leads us to great tribulation, I don't know what the journey is. If this leads us to war, if this leads us to a breakup of of what we understood as nations and we, we developed some other system in this world. I don't know. I don't know what's around the corner. But I know the one that does know, and that's the Lord God. And I, 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 I want him to judge. I want him to judge. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes I look at this world going down the toilet and I'm just like, well, Lord, it's, it's like you're just, you're taking my heart. Whatever pieces of my heart that I still have in this world, it's like you're just pulling my heart away from that. And maybe it's for the best. Because if your judgment falls, I want to be able to rejoice in your judgment. <laughs> you know, rather than be so attached and say, Lord, what are you doing? No, you know, be mindful about what decisions you make. You know, be careful. You know, understand you have things to risk. Maybe you have families and you have wives and you have children, decisions to make for their sake. I have decisions to make for this church. So we need the Lord. We need his word. We need his counsel. I'm not here pretending I know every answer, Okay. I'm not pretending that, okay? But, you know, I'm a pastor of this church, and I'm a pastor at New York of the Church for a reason. You know, we're here for a reason. We're here to support each other. We're here to 
understand God's judgment. We're here to think about this world. We're here to think about what battles are we fighting, right? And as I said, man, just being a normal human being these days, you're already bad at fighting a war. <laughs> just being a normal married man with kids, you're fighting a war. Just being a normal person that reads the Bible and goes to church, you're fighting a war already, okay? And let's just continue with the mindset. No, we want to choose life. You know, we need to continue in giving the gospel to people that they may choose eternal life. You know, we, we, you know the, the coming years, and I don't want to scare anybody, they might be very, very hard. You know, the, the enjoyments that we have in our life may be taken away. But nothing will take away our eternal life. Nothing will take away our destination in heaven. Nothing will take away our love that God has given us, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Nothing will take away the treasures that we lay up in heaven. This is why we need to be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. Okay? Look at verse number 11. <coughs> and touching the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. O house of David, thus saith the Lord, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go out like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. You know, God's given them still a last opportunity. Not from being not destroyed, because they're already being destroyed. It's already happening. But for a last opportunity of complete destruction. The, the message to the king Zedekiah, tomorrow morning, do things right. Judge correctly. Walk in my ways. Follow after my commandments. You start doing that, King Zedekiah, and you're not going to be utterly destroyed. There was still a chance. Though we know they didn't do it. They still got destroyed by the Babylonians. And the reason I, I, I say, uh, I wanted to look at that is because in Proverbs 14, verse 34, I'll just read it, it says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a reproach to any people. Australia is a sinful, wicked nation. Okay? If we want this nation to be exalted, it's righteousness. Okay? So why we got soul winning, we want to have the imputed righteousness of Christ on more people. And then as Christians, we want to continue walking in righteousness. You know, don't give up. You know, keep walking in righteousness. New normal, old normal, we continue walking in righteousness. Okay? If anything's going to save Australia, it's God's people. Okay? Just trying to turn the tide. Maybe, like this, maybe there's still an opportunity. Okay? But I know our politicians aren't going to do it. It's got to be us. It's got to be us. All right? We're going to keep preaching God's word without compromise. We're going to keep standing for God no matter what. Okay? And be careful. What battles are we fighting? Are we fighting the battles that God wants us to fight? Or are we not? Look at verse number 13. Behold, I am against the old inhabitants of the valley and rock of the plain. Thus saith the Lord, which say, Who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter into our habitations? But I will punish you according to the fruits of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about it. Why do I believe that we are dealing with God's judgment? You know, why? Well, like we see here in verse number 14, God says, I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings. What is the fruit of the doings of Australia? They're choosing death. They're not choosing the way of life. This is why I think it's God's judgment. You know, if, if our nation was anti-abortion, if that was illegal, if our nation wasn't trying to bring in euthanasia, you know, if, if our nation, you know, still had a fear of God and, and wanted to know, like King Zedekiah, Jeremiah, tell us the truth, and then we had, like, COVID-19, then I'd just say it was just a pestilence. It's just another thing that's, <laughs> that's just going through the world. You know, it's just, there's been unusual days in the past. It's just unusual days again. But when I look at the corruption in this world, when I look at the forces of weakness, how they're trying to destroy families, they're trying to destroy churches, they're trying to destroy the Bible, okay? They're trying to destroy the distinctions between what is light and dark, between what is good and right. They're calling what is good evil and they call what's evil good. I just look at the situation and I say, wow, Jeremiah, this is Australia. You're preaching against Australia. Remember, Jeremiah was called the prophet to the nations. I think Jeremiah has a word to say about Australia today. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you.